Chapter 18, Late November, 1981 Sitting at the kitchen table after finishing the dishes, once again the place is clean. One more day done. The teenager's off somewhere, Dick and Judy both upstairs. Blessed silence. Solitude. This is the first time since my arrival that the kitchen's been empty in the evening. What a gift. I can sit right here, right in my journal, and sip a cup of tea. This household is crowded. So full, the only private place I can make for myself is the upstairs bathroom. At night, I unroll my sleeping bag in there, my head resting two feet from the toilet bowl. But at least I can close the door. Got to have a little privacy. Got to sort through my life. Drove over from Idaho to Wyoming over a month ago. Managed to find the car we just bought. Phil had hidden it from me just before he was admitted to the hospital again. Now he's the one who will have to deal with the old truck. Didn't have any trouble finding the car. Knew it would be in the garage of the only friend he had in Idaho. Had to talk the friend into giving me the key. Embarrassing, but nothing compared to what I've been through this past year with that monster, that fiend. So here I am. Not only was I unable to save Phil, but I was the one who, in the end, needed to be saved had to get away, knew that on some level a couple of months ago was biding my time, slowly saving money from the part-time job I took. The man is crazy. The man is sociopathic, beyond redemption, and dangerous, scary. Finally have to admit that, admit my fear of him. So, Though on a conscious level I wanted to save him, on an unconscious level I was afraid of him, his latent violence. Of the two, which was the stronger motivation? And what is the psychological link between them? How do I understand myself well enough so that I never do that again? Still can't believe how I could have put myself in that situation in the first place. From shining heroine of open space to being dragged down to hell by the devil himself. Finally escaped the house at 5 a.m. that morning, hid out at a new friend's house for three days. When I heard Phil was again hospitalized, I found the car and drove over here. God, I hope he stays sick for a while. Why doesn't he just go ahead and die? Leave me alone. Hope he doesn't think to look for me here. Sitting here, absorbed, obsessively going over and over the events which brought me to this place on earth, this point in time. Want to understand. Want to learn. For God's sakes, don't want to ever be here again. Suddenly, a knock at the back door. Reach over from where I'm sitting to open it. Stand up to see who's there. A small, stocky man, smiling beatifically, round head covered with a knitted blue cap. He removes the cap and bows. You must be Anne, he exclaims joyously. I'm George Vlastos, and I owe you money. It is true. Years before I had done some astrological work through the mail for one George Vlastos, whom I had never met, and he had never paid me. Over the years, I had nursed a grudge against this man, seeing him as archetype of the creative artist who wrongly considers himself above mundane responsibilities. Now he tells me he had not asked for the work himself, and he had assumed the person who had asked for it had paid me. Over the years, he continues, still smiling beatifically, I heard and felt strange, even hostile vibrations coming from this woman I had never met. As he says this, he reaches into his pocket and hands me $40. Well, come in, I exclaim, my previous grudge against him disappearing in the face of such disarming honesty. In his presence, my obsessive ruminations over Phil has also disappeared. In only a few minutes, he has startled me into aliveness. I am utterly captivated by this man, his huge expressive energy, the light twinkling merrily through his big brown eyes. Chapter 19, December 1981. I stand at the kitchen sink in sweat-stiffened pajamas, disheveled, 
utterly spent. Sunlight streams through the window. The light hurts my eyes. Haven't combed my hair in weeks. Haven't been outside. Haven't seen a soul. Lost all track of time. Mired in some kind of personal hell, my entire life congealing in upon me, suffocating. Can barely hold myself up, exhausted. Reality has collapsed into the black hole of my body, the throbbing pain in my jaw so overwhelming I cannot sleep. Night after night, day after day, I lie in an endless stupor of exhaustion shot through with piercing stabs of agony. Slowly I turn the faucet on, hold up my cup to fill it, turn the faucet off. Each movement I make is deliberate, takes great effort. Each movement seems suspended in time, unconnected to anything else, mired in a thick, stifling void. Drink, for God's sakes, drink. Got to get something down. Even if you can't eat, at least don't get dehydrated. Walk slowly back into the darkened bedroom, shaky, fall back into the bed. Maybe this time I can sleep. Oh God, let me sleep. At least lie here, try to rest. Dimly, I sense my gratitude to George for leaving me his house during his absence. Appreciation flutters, swells feebly in my chest. Originating somewhere beneath the stupor, this feeling flickers into life and thrusts up momentarily to push aside both the stupor and the pain. Oh my God, what if I'd gotten sick at Dick's house with all those people there? No matter how bad this is, at least I'm alone. I can be sick, alone, in peace. Amazing. Just when I needed so desperately to be alone, I found myself alone. And only then did my jaw begin to ache again, aching now so much it blots out the entire world. As if my body knew it was safe to let down, take off the armor which sheathed me for so long and reveal its wounding. As if my body knows, truly knows. Oh God, the pain, overwhelming, blots out everything else. There's, there is nothing else. Nothing but piercing stabs of pain, lightning stabbing the night. All the foolish hopes and plans and victories and defeats of my entire life. Mere ashes in my mouth. Gritty. Gagging. Grit my teeth. Grind them. Jaws grinding into the void. If I weren't in so much pain, I'd be dead. I'd rather be dead than in this much pain. Despair. Darkness falling further, deeper into the dark night of the soul, drifting off again, pain dulled by slow, lazy circling down, down, down. Up, up, loosened from gravity's pull, there is no orientation, just this mindless, aimless spiraling, spiraling, as if my body knows exactly how much I can take, administers a mild soporific to get me through, lost in never-never land, swaying, swirling through the clouds. Slowly, once again, I come to, ah, oh, here I am again, lying immobile in George's darkened bedroom, the way I've been for, what has it been? Two weeks? Will it ever end? Who cares? It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. There is nothing left. I am surrendered into nothingness. Lying here the same, but, but different. Not sure, but perhaps, yes, something inside me has subtly altered. I'm no longer the same person who drifted off the last time. Something inside me feels different. Feel energy starting to move, the life force catching hold, a gentle quickening. Want to see George again want to see his merry, laughing face. At first with him I felt strange, his presence so full, so delightful, brilliant. He calls forth a different attitude from deep within me, one long forgotten, learning how to move again, unplanned, unexpected, surprise, 
throwing up my hands, throwing back my head, throat vibrating, cracking into actual laughter. Face splitting into smiles, destroying the long, stern set of my jaw, loosening muscles, bones grown stiff from holding myself upright, righteous, uptight. How utterly unlike Phil is George. Moving from the inside of himself out into the world, giving of himself his love of life, his huge protean creativity, want to become like George, want to discover that part of myself that is truly happy and creative. I think of George and I feel life begin to move within me, small, momentary, hesitant, tiny surges of vitality for the first time, the first time in years, the first time ever. But then the contrast. Lying here in the dim light, Phil's face still looms before me. Those glittery eyes, those eyes that fascinated me, drew me to them, kept me there. Aha! Another motivation surfaces. Beneath the desire to save, beneath the fear, was this fascination, the extraordinary magnetism of that intensely powerful glitter. Mind swimming back into the past, falling further through time, back to the wet California winter after I had been fired, living in the basement, the same darkness, the frozen despair I was feeling then, so unlike now. Now despair is palpable, real, the horror of a raw, stabbing pain. Then it had been numbness, denial. I hated myself hated what had happened to me, hated what I had become, felt guilty for who I was, the failure of my life, couldn't tolerate the pain of feeling my entire life as a waste, couldn't afford to feel the pain then, wasn't strong enough to take either the pain of my life or the truth about it. All I could do was stay in my head, make up lies. I projected those aspects of myself that I feared and hated onto others. It was their fault. They did that to me. They were mean, bad, cruel, crazy. I am the good girl, the one who knows the truth, and for that was victimized, scapegoated by a president too chicken to stand up to his own trustees. So I thought. So in a reflex effort to survive what had happened to me, I twisted truth into its opposite, flipping self-hatred into self-glorification. One night I had a dream a very vivid dream, the most numinous dream of my life. I dreamed that I was riding my horse again, heading towards the rising sun. Suddenly, Goldie wanted to go home again. She wanted to turn and go back the way she had come. Reluctantly, I gave her her head. We came to a thick stone wall, higher than my head while sitting upon her. Directly in front of me, an open iron gate. To the left of the gate, a huge wolf, the guardian of the gate. The wolf's eyes were glittery, glittery and yellow, a baleful, evil yellow. In the midst of recalling this dream, I see Phil's eyes staring at me the way they did that last night. Yellow eyes, yellow and glittery. Not the whites of his eyes, but the actual iris, yellow, possessed, as if an evil spirit had taken him over. I am reminded of something he said once, how, quote, the devil took me, bounced me off the wall like a ball, unquote. Those eyes the night we met, glittery, the glitter so bright I didn't notice the weird yellow, the glitter a feverish flashing that aped true aliveness. I was searching for aliveness, and I got glitter instead. Glitter which soon transformed into its opposite, the darkening of the light, as I was catapulted into the hell of life with Phil. I was so busy justifying why I was there, was determined to heal his body, change his mind, save his soul, that I didn't notice Phil was the wolf. In sheep's clothing, of course. Sick, in a seemingly weakened condition, needing my help. The perfect hook. 
I was so identified with my specialness as a mental and spiritual guide, helping people, knowing their paths better than they did. No wonder his particular psychosis triggered my own, dovetailed with it perfectly. In the dream, my horse wanted to go home again. Home was somewhere on the other side of the gate, but in order to go home, I had to pass by the wolf, had to stare him down, had to dare to stare into those glittery yellow eyes to immobilize him, to turn him to stone. I had awakened sweating, terrified from this dream, the figure of the wolf looming large, numinous, haunting. Over the following months, the dream stayed with me, skittering in and out of consciousness. I could not forget it. What did it mean to go home again? Five months later, I was back in my old hometown, married to my high school boyfriend. This sudden, shocking turn in my destiny had the same uncanny feel to it as did the dream. I had come home, to my hometown, to my true love. Naturally, I assumed the meaning of the dream was fulfilled. But the wolf, of course, was still waiting at the gate. And I, as Little Red Riding Hood, still naive, still believing in my mission as savior of souls, was destined one day to meet him up close, face to face, eyes riveted. One of us was to stare the other down. Chapter 20 Late December, 1981. Standing at the kitchen sink of a lovely little A-frame on a mountain, staring out the window while scooping tiny bites of mint chocolate chip haagen ice cream directly out of the pint container. Outside, howling wind swirls thickening snow into oblivion. Inside, New Yorker magazines stacked in the polished wicker basket by the fireplace, Hot tub and jacuzzi bubbling, steaming on the sun porch. Enormous white fluffy down comforter floating on the king-sized bed. It is Christmas time, and I am house-sitting. I feel naked, raw, newborn. The sickness of my soul has been scarred away through long-running fever and piercing pain. I am thinking how extraordinary it is that I have just discovered Jonathan Shell's masterpiece, The Fate of the Earth, as serialized in The New Yorker, how extraordinary that I've just been granted new life at the exact time Shell has documented our collective fear of nuclear death. Finally, the time has come. Shell's disclosure throws down the gauntlet. No longer do we have to pretend that nothing is wrong. No longer do I have to keep my fear of nuclear death secret, a secret festering within me since childhood. Quote, from the time you were three years old, unquote, my mother never tires of telling me, you refused to be touched. You were silent, but I could tell you were thinking all the time. All the time thinking, thinking about death, about the whole world suddenly blinking out in one unimaginably cataclysmic explosion. Somehow in my three-year-old brain there was already implanted the idea that the world would end in my lifetime. I was chicken little and someday the sky would fall in. It could be tonight, it could be tomorrow, it could be in three more years or five. So there's no sense taking plans seriously. No sense getting excited about anything. Underneath everything we think and do crouches that yawning black hole, its massive devouring gravity sucking everything up, compressing it to nothing. For me, no matter what was happening in my daily life, this secret horror undermined it. Given the cloud mushrooming over everything, doing the dishes for that one whole year was an extraordinary act of faith. The world wouldn't end before I got that horse. I wouldn't let it. For that one year, my personal will was stronger than our collective death wish. Later, even when astride Goldie, running free through fields of gold, I couldn't forget for more than a few minutes at a time. Nuclear extinction was the larger perspective, 
a context so inevitably universal and terrible that all foreground considerations were like dots on a screen, blinking in and out at random, all of them canceled by the vastness of the inexhaustible void. Secretly, I knew. My personal life, our common life, standing precariously above that secret certainty, that terrible insecurity, is a lie. In a bleak inversion of purpose, of meaning, I knew that, literally, nothing counts but this fire in the end. For nearly four decades, I expected hell on earth, looked for it around every corner. As each new year renewed Earth's orbit around the sun, I was more surprised than the year before. Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it won't soon. Indeed, the longer we continue, the more certain our destruction in the very near future. Finally, I did land in a kind of hell, though not the one I had bargained for. In a karmic bargain to the death, I shook hands with Phil, the devil himself. Now, having only barely recovered from the fallout from that experience, I was reading the inside thoughts of a man whose profound despair concerning the fate of the earth was matched only by his heartfelt compassion for both the planet herself and all creatures living upon her. Intuitively, I knew that Shell's unblinking willingness to face up to our common fate his courage in directing his attention unswervingly to what lay ahead for us all was the key. His awesome and moving disclosure of what underneath we dreaded as an absolute certainty, but on a conscious level had so numbed ourselves to the terror it evoked that we could not feel it all, was the most significant human achievement of this century. The New Yorker's decision to public Shell's confessions turned the tide, made it possible, and, as we learned how to become more and more accepting of our buried terror and rage, utterly urgent and necessary that we redirect human energy from what it had been until now, the inexorable march to apocalypse. Shell's lucent description of the seeming inevitability of the forces hurting us like lemmings toward the sea of mass death was also, paradoxically, a prescription for a different kind of future. By facing up to what was really going on worldwide, by truly embracing our common secret despair, we could erase its power over us, could replace it with grace, the intervention of something more than human, divinity shining from within. Needless to say, I was ecstatic. Spent those two weeks on the mountain on top of the world, surveying my kingdom, preparing to devote my life to this suddenly legitimate business of saving the world. It was time, and I was ready to help take off the blinders, to offer my contribution to our common recovery from the amnesia afflicting the vast majority of humanity since Hiroshima. Five months later, in May of 1982, an estimated one million people marched for peace in the streets of New York City. Chapter 21, November 1983. The kitchen is small, dark, and grimy. The floor is sticky the refrigerator full of moldy leftovers. Huge sticky jars of peanut butter and grape jelly stand open on the counter, sitting on and surrounded by crumbs, inviting flies. In summer, flies buzz everywhere, their eggs hidden in the curves of logs of the cabin walls. Every time I enter the kitchen, I feel depressed. How grimy it is, no matter how often it is cleaned. Also feel oddly dizzy in here, and no wonder, the floor slants in one direction, the ceiling in another. This kitchen is the original room of the fairly large cabin known as the Simpson House, recently renamed Heartland House. For many years a hippie enclave in Jackson, this resort town in the mountains of western Wyoming, 
The cabin also contains five tiny dark bedrooms off the narrow hallway and a fairly large and comfortable living room with wood stove and couches. Only peace activists live here now. A few months ago, the last holdover from the Simpson House days left, a skinny, long-haired freak who just walked out into the coming winter with his backpack on his back. I am washing the mountains of dishes that have stacked up in here, staring out through the window at the logs of the cabin next door, secretly resentful that I'm the one to finally end up doing them. The job is taking forever, and no one is volunteering to help. Awaiting a phone call from an artist who we hope will agree to illustrate the cover for next month's issue of Heartland, the tabloid magazine I founded for networking peace activists in the Rocky Mountain region, and I am worried, as usual, about the money, whether we'll have the money to put out the next issue. And I'm upset with another peace organization over in Cheyenne for ignoring Heartland in its survey of what is going on in the region. I'm relieved that Kate has finally decided to resign from the staff of the magazine. Her energy was so paranoid, as if she had looked nuclear death in the face for so long, had documented the mind-numbing facts of it with such relentless, passionate intensity that she finally lost it, became as destructive as what she was raging against. I also wonder about Pamela, so insecure and needy, covering it up with bravado, an increasingly shrill dogmatism. Our meetings getting more and more contentious. We are a bunch of prima donnas all expecting to be the center of attention, miffed when our individual ideas are not pushed through. Next week I have to go out on the road again, braving windy, snowy, icy roads of high deserts and mountain passes in the same car I used to escape from Phil. No front-wheel drive. What's infinitely worse Two months ago, the reverse gear gave out, and I have no money to get it fixed. Can only go forwards, can make no mistakes, can only park where I don't have to back up to get out. Can't miss any turns. Scares the hell out of me. Interesting metaphor. Feels like I can only go forward in my life from here on, also. That I cannot afford mistakes. I'm 40 years old, and my body is talking to me warning me, insisting I change my habits. But I can't do it now. Too much work to do. This is more important. There's nothing more important than working for peace on earth. Got to keep going. Got to keep seeding heartland into the isolated small towns all over the deep west region. Usually a couple of lonely activists in each town, glad to see me, glad to find out what's going on elsewhere want me to help them activate others where they live. Infuriating. Most people still so stupid, so ignorant of what we are all facing. They don't want to stop their materialistic bourgeois lifestyles for even one minute to help turn the tide, change the fate of the planet. Most of them look at me like I'm crazy, rebuff my asking for money, turn the other way when they see me coming. Their eyes glaze over when I list types of missiles and count them for both sides. 50,000. Can you believe? Or when I talk about the half-life of plutonium, 24,000 years. It's unimaginable toxicity, the fact that one pound of it, if distributed equally to the lungs of everyone on Earth, would kill us all. No wonder they can't hear me. There is no way the mind can comprehend, much less contemplate, what I have to say. And sometimes I think saying it makes it worse. That when we really face up to what's been going on since World War II, when we really see the full and continuously growing enormity of the hair-trigger, computer-guided, worldwide nuclear infrastructure, we either become ravaged by it or else in order to survive what we see, shut down even deeper inside. There is nothing we can do. It's already too late. Even I think that sometimes. Sometimes I wonder if my own desperate attempts to get people to wake up is just a distraction from what I know to be true, a deep, deep sense of utter hopelessness 
a despair so total that there's no light at the end of this tunnel into oblivion. Even here, in this beautiful little mountain valley, where people do appreciate the earth more than in cities, the jocks are so into their various sports and Patagonias that they refuse to acknowledge larger issues. I came here to get away from all that, they say irritably. How can they not think about it? How can they act as if it doesn't matter? Reminds me of when I was a kid, suffering under that secret terror which I knew could not be broached with others. Nothing has changed except that I've become the fool for speaking up and for thinking Shell's essays would really turn the tide. Exhausted, sick and tired of it all, but I can't stop now. How can I stop when this is the time when we must wake up? If we don't do it now, it'll be too late. If it isn't too late already. Don't feel good. Feel chronically angry, frustrated, depleted. Have to flog myself to get going each morning. Oh good, the phone. Hope it's the call I've been waiting for. <laughs>